you didn't know before we were even born for you are God and Lord we just sometimes we can't get our get our minds around this awesomeness of you but yet we love you Lord because of your love for us that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us and Lord that is so wonderful to know that you love us even before we knew you Lord you loved us and if we didn't have to earn your love and earn your respect and care but Lord that it was there just for us to come to Lord, you are good. We love you and we praise you and we ask your blessing upon the gathering tonight, the study of your word. Father, that your word, it's a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our path. The entrance of your words give us life. And Lord, uh, that, that life comes from you, Father. And, and, and Lord, your word is healing to all of our flesh. And we thank you, Lord, that your word has in it all the things we need. It's healing. It's joy. It's peace. It's, it's blessing. It's, it's everything we need, Father, is in you, in your word. And you are the Word, for in the beginning was the Word. We thank you, we praise you, we thank you in Jesus' wonderful name. And everyone said amen. And let's have a little time of praise and worship. Praise the Lord.
Every day should be Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Praise God. He is risen. Praise the Lord. Every day is Easter. Praise God. Thank you, Peyton. Thank you very much. And uh, we can be seated. And uh, I, that part of that song, it says, um, he borrowed a tomb for three days. He borrowed it. He borrowed it. He said he was um, buried in a rich man's grave. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea loaned him his uh, grave for a few days. That's all he was going to need it because he was resurrecting. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ is um, it's a justification for us because he ri rose from the dead means we will too. It's not, you know, sometimes as uh, people who look at the gospel from the outside and, and haven't experienced the transform transforming power uh, that the Holy Spirit brings into our lives when we're saved, they, they look at the gospel story and say, oh, this was a good man. And look what happens to good men. They get themselves nailed to a cross. They get killed. Look at that other good man. John the Baptist got his head cut off. You know, and the, they sort of look at it as this is what happens to good folk. You know, you better, uh, um, better be careful if you're going to be a good guy because you're going to end up somewhere like that. But the whole thing is that when Jesus, his was a substitutionary thing. Your sins and my sins. And even this is something that uh, takes a little explanation. It says... Uh, John wrote in the gospel, he said, Christ, this is a truth, you know, worthy of all ac acceptation, that Christ died for our sins, and not our sins only, but the sins of the world. And someone will say, well, that means that everybody saves? He says, no, you've got to receive it. You've got to believe it. You can have a million dollars in the bank, but if you don't go down there and take it out, then you'll never have it. It's there for you. And just like the, 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 the promise of the resurrection is there for whosoever will. Jesus said in John 6, 37, whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. He said, you believe in God, believe also in me. He said uh, uh, t in John 5, um, 5, 25, it says, uh, he who hears my words and believes on him who sent me has, past tense and present rather, has eternal life and will not come into judgment, but passes from death into life. Of course, the, my contradictory alarm goes right off because it says we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So it says, but whoever believes in me, uh, they said, will not come into judgment. Well, it means you won't come into the judgment for your sins because it's on him. It's finished. So what he refuses to remember, what he has uh, taken away as far as east is from the west and is put to the deepest part of the sea, never to be remembered again, don't you let it haunt you either because God has put it away. It has to be put away or the death of Christ was in vain. All our sin was on him. And what freedom that gives us, not freedom to sin, now we're free to live unto righteousness because sin is not an issue anymore. It is done away with. It is, it is, a, it is gone. It's, it was dissolved by the power of the cross, the blood of Jesus Christ, God himself becoming flesh and dying in our place and then resurrecting as we studied and talked about the, um, the festivals of, uh, of, um, of the Hebrew calendar, the first fruits, Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus Christ was the festival of first fruits. Uh, we are going to be the harvest when he returns. Praise God. You know, it's just, uh, you know, get in practice, get in practice, you know, uh, do it. Have, have, have rapture practice. He's coming, you know, and, uh, um, you know, I used to weigh 220 pounds. Now I'm down to about 175, and I still can't jump much higher. But when I weigh less than air, when the Spirit of God comes upon me, praise God, there's no limit to what our resurrected bodies are going to be able to do. It said, uh, he said, we're, John uh, wrote again, he says, Beloved, it's not sure what we will be like. He said, it's, it's not certain what we'll be like, but we know we'll be like him. And, uh, and we'll see him as he is. Well, if we're going to be like him, and we are children of God, and he is not only our Savior, our God, but he's also our brother and our friend. That's amazing that one entity of God can have all those relationships with us. You know, to actually go to the king and say, oh, the king, he's my friend. And even to go to the king and say, he's my brother. And yet at the same time, with great adoration and great humility and great subjection to say, he is the Lord my God. I worship him. All that in one, you know, is, uh, is an amazing thing. And we are going to be like him. The disciples all locked in a room.
for fear of the Jews after the resurrection of Jesus, and they got a little emboldened. Well, we killed Jesus. Let's go after the rest of them. And so they're locked, they're quiet there, and all of a sudden, there he is. There he is. You know, it's like, how'd you get in here? It was that they were just so overwhelmed, they didn't ask that question, you know, that he said, the first words, you know, Jesus always says to us in his resurrected presence, after now it's all put away, now the door is open for Jew and Gentile alike. Before then, he was presenting himself only to Israel. Israel rejected him except for a few. There's always a remnant. And now his arms are open for all, whosoever will. And there he is, and his first words is, peace, fear not. Peace, fear not. So let's obey God. Let's have peace in our life, and let's fear not. We have nothing to fear because Jesus has overcome the grave. And, uh, and because he lives, we will live also. How did I do that? Okay. And that's a good place to, uh, to start here about some things I want to uh, talk about. Um, I, um, oh Lord, we just ask your blessing on your word, Father. We prayed already to open this service, Lord, but just ask your anointing upon your word, Father, to become that the book speaks to us, Father, speaks to our heart, our mind, our spirit, Lord, that it is a living word. There's no other book on the face of the earth like the word of God because of that very reason, it is the word of God. And Lord, just bless us through it and help us to grow thereby in Jesus' name. Um, in this uh, world, we uh, have some crazy things here uh, in technology. Uh, I finally got that back up. Uh, I was working with a bank, and I'm kind of old school and old-fashioned about things. I used to be in business myself. You're in business. And, um, you know, I was, uh, I was a photographer, had a photography business, and also... Uh, uh, as an interpreter, I also worked as a freelance interpreter with uh, uh, for the state and um, and what have you. And I'm deal I'm used to dealing with people face to face. You know, you you get relationships, even business relationships. You got stores you prefer to go to and things like that. Well, I went to open a bank account at Chase Bank, and uh, uh, in Elizabethtown they have a branch. They had this special thing in if you uh, if you open a checking account with them. And I, I like to grab things after investigate them a little bit and say this is a win win situation. Uh, I got a credit card that I didn't want, not from them, but from another place, uh, from Venmo, because Venmo sent an email saying if I get their credit card, they'll give me $100. What's it going to cost me to get the credit card? Nothing. Uh, how long do I have to keep it? As long as I want. And you're just going to give me $100. Yeah. Well, I got a Venmo credit card, and they gave me $100. And I'm still using it some. And the key is, is to always pay those things off at the end of each month. Don't let that credit temptation overwhelm live within your means you know and if you're a tither you give to god god will bless you and you'll be able to do that but so there's a thing going on with chase bank and it's look good i investigated it checked it out and the thing is i did it once before over two years ago and i got a few hundred dollars put into my account that's uh, 600 uh, all total just by opening a checking account and putting some money in a savings account for 90 days and then they give you this money they put it there. They, they really keep the word on it. And I closed it all because I didn't like having two banks, you know. Um, with a credit card, I take advantage of, uh, of getting kickback. You know, I get a 2% back on paying my credit card off. I got uh, mentioned that the church is doing that now on, on our credit card. So you can make a little money on that. But uh, the point is I went there. I sat down there with a woman, got to know her, just talking to her about other things. And I said, now, it's okay I do this again? She said, yeah, it's fine. And uh, she was a Korean lady, and uh, but she spoke very good English. I think she's next generation uh, from Radcliffe, soldier's wife. Well, we got going, and I had her business card. She stapled it to the paperwork. But I had a question, something I needed to know today. It was about transferring the money and all that. So I thought, well, I'll just call her, and her name is Millie or something. And I get on uh, the phone. Well, the phone, I get this robocall at the bank. And a push button, you know, at this, and you got this menu, like four or five things you got to push, you know. And I'm saying, oh, this is so frustrating. And where's the, I'm waiting, the one that says if you want to talk to a real person. But they don't offer that one. You know, it just goes in a circle. I'm pushing zeros and offer operator. And finally I get, and it goes to the thing and it says, thank you for calling Chase Bank. And our, our goal is customer service and everything. And all of our representatives are busy right now. And please call back later. Thank you. Bye-bye. Click. Not even a voicemail. And on her card, I happened to notice not even an email address. It used to be at least you could email somebody. But now they don't give you an email, and they don't give you a voicemail. They just say, you're going to have to play the phone roulette lottery, and maybe you'll win out and get through them. 
and, uh, and get to them. And I'm, I'm really getting frustrated, so I call the 800 number for service. It's set on there. It goes to, you know, the National Call Center, and this fella there, I'm speaking to him. He sounds like a regular Joe. And as he says, well, what, what branch are you trying to get a hold of? And I told him, and I uh, gave him the zip code. And he said, yeah, that's in Elizabethtown, Kentucky. I got a number for you. And I said, the number you just gave me, the ones I've already called, and that's the ones that they clicked me off on. So I don't have to talk to you to get the number to call that I already have the number. I'm wanting to get through to a real person. And he said, well, I really can't help you there. You're going to have to. I said, oh, oh, by the way, where are you anyway? Just, you know, well, it was all friendly. You know, I, I might make it sound like it wasn't because of my frustration with the, with, the, with the silliness of it. And I said, oh, and by the way, where are you? Where are you? What's the weather like there? He said, I'm in the Philippines. <laughs> so I'm trying to get in touch with a bank 15 miles away, and I'm talking to a guy on the other side of the world. And I'm thinking, we are in a new age, aren't we? And I said, I am, t and I told him that exact thing. I said, here you are in the Philippines. I said, you must work the night shift. Because <laughs> I was calling sometime in the morning, it was before noon, so it's probably like 4 or 5 in the morning. Uh, if it's 10, well, it might be 10 p.m. there. If it's 10 a.m. here, I think, if they're right in the other side. And I, I laughed. I said, are you kidding me? I said, here you are on the other side of the world and tried to connect me to a bank that's 15 miles down the road. And he said, yeah, you might be better off just dropping in. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, we're back to that. But the whole point is we live in a new age, in a new world. And uh, it's uh, and for us, some of us old folks, um, older folks, I won't say old, older folks, it can be uh, it can be daunting, it can be challenging. And um, I called a buddy of mine today, and um, I say a buddy, a young buddy of mine, a guy that I kind of um, uh, like to contact now and then to talk about general. We wish to bug each other uh, in church. Uh, uh, he called me a a boomer, and I called him a a, um, a snowflake, yeah. And so we, we have a little fun with that. He called me one time. He said, oh, you're a boomer. And I said, ah, you're a snowflake. And so uh, that was uh, how it goes. But um, I, uh, I, I uh, suddenly he come to my mind because I just like the fella. And uh, uh, we all know him around here. Uh, Peyton knows him real well, and so does Jason. But um, I sent him a, a, a link to a, um, a video on YouTube, and it's a a rap video, a Christian rap song, and this guy has liked rap, and I never cared for rap much, but this song I like because it had a, an old song in the background, an old Sammy Cooke song about um, uh, what's, um, trying to think what the uh, uh, long time coming, you know, and there's th but this was a Christian version about it's a long time coming, but Jesus is coming, and, um, and I sent him that video, and I I said, Sharon heard me playing that and thought maybe it was you that I had uh, because it was, it was rap. And the uh, guy's name is Bizzle. Have you ever heard of Bizzle, the rapper Bizzle? But this is a good song, Long Time Coming. If, you, if you'll ever like a rap song, a Christian rap song, you'll like this one. <laughs> but I barely did because it just, it's just not my music genre, you know. Uh, but anyway, I, uh, I told him, I said, I never heard of him before I found that. But then I got talking to him here, and I said, um, I'm going to be teaching Bible study tonight, and I wonder if you'd tell me in a few words what the concerns are of your generation. I said, I know the things an old guy like me faces, but I really don't fully know what your people face. I said, I had a frustrating day with a bank. It was all based on technology, probably not uh, something that bugs your generation much. Then I got to thinking, oh, what does bug you guys? You know, I could ask Peyton, what bugs you guys? You just heard what bugs me. What bugs you guys? He'll probably say you old folks, but <laughs> but no, I know better. Huh? House prices, okay, prices, those are things that bug us all. Yeah, yeah, it's another thing, you know, inflation, you know, the way it is. But I said, um, I said, so I got to thinking, I was asking him, I said, what, what bugs you guys, LOL? You know, uh, I said, clue me in a little bit, please. I think I, I think I might preach. And he said, well, this generation, he's speaking now, so this generation is constantly in comparison with social media. Social media is their, you know, is what uh, they're always looking at, and what 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 kind of influences them. Influencers are actually called uh, blogs and, and social media people, Instagram that have accounts that grow in and they get money for it if they get enough. YouTube people uh, make a living. We know people uh, that just eat at restaurants in Gatlinburg every day. And they have a blog, have a YouTube channel, and they got millions of th or thousands or whatever of followers, so they get a good income just from eating out every day. And some of those restaurants want them to eat at their place to give them a good review, you know. And so those are influencers. That's that generation. 
because they're influencing me when I watch their uh, YouTube video. I don't. Sharon does. She uh, she likes a few of these folks. Some of, but I like these guys that fly some drones. I like the technology of drones, and I'm into that. And I won't digress to that any much. So those guys influence me. But this generation is constantly in comparison with social media. There's always a prettier person. So there's always a bigger house, and it's too expensive. And there's always more successful careers. And people are looking at this fake world of social media and comparing themselves to it because it's not real. You see some of these folks and you think, God, goodness sakes, they never got to worry in the world, do they? Everything's so clean and crisp and nice and sharp and, and so upscale and so going. And, man, they're so cool, you know. And then stick some bubba like me or um, I, won't, I won't pick on you, but stick some one, someone like us in front of a camera and, you know, well, <laughs> shazam, you know. It's just that... <laughs> That's somebody who knew Andy Griffith. But there's, you know, he said more successful careers. Nothing ever seems to content. People are no satisfied. And I said, well, now you're starting to talk a way that, that bridges generations because contentment uh, is something that is hard for people to find in this world. You know, um, Paul the Apostle said, I was, he said, uh, I both know how to, to uh, suffer need. I've been hungry. I've been in the deep, and he was beat up, and he had a lot of problems preaching this gospel as a Jewish convert uh, to Christianity. He was still a Jew, but now he was a, you know, a true Jew. And he said, uh, all the things he mentioned he suffered for, he said, I have both been abased and I have suffered need, but I've also had plenty and been doing good. He said, I have learned, and this is a lesson we need to learn. He says, I have learned in whatever state I find myself, be content, be content. It's going to come to our scripture in a minute because we do have a word tonight. And I'm, I don't want to go too long on this. but And he said, spiritually speaking of his generation, now this is another bridge. Being a Christian himself, he, he, he has to break with his generation. Being a Christian myself, I have to break with people in my generation. There's some wiped out people my age that are too much to the extreme of, of, uh, of anti, uh, anti-socialism and anti-things, you know, what's, uh, what uh, 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 the new things happening, you know. But... Um, he said, uh, the spiritually, God is irrelevant, it seems, to my generation. God has become irrelevant to many people. The, the Barnes uh, or the Pew, Pew Research Center, who just does all these surveys of, of, uh, of trends in the world, especially in the area of faith and religion, they say the column has astronomically grown of people who check the box none when they ask you what is your faith or what is your religion used to be, well, I'm Protestant, I'm Catholic, I'm Jew, or I'm agnostic or atheist even or something, or a Buddhist or, you know, um, I believe in the toad frog, whatever. But now they say none. There's just the big thing that says, I'm none, I'm nothing. I, religion, that means nothing to me. They have become insulated from a spiritual life. And a man is, you know, God has created us a tripart being. We are a triunity. We were created in the image of God. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are created in that image. We are a triunity also. We are body, we are mind, and we are spirit. And uh, neither one functions separately from the other. You take away our spirit, we're like an animal. You take away our mind, then we're, we're a body with, uh, with a spirit that's on life support. You know, I mean, they all three function together as a unity. We were created in his image. He is a unity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And uh, when I look at Donnie, I just don't see Donnie, just a man sitting there, or Don. Uh, but I, somebody called you Donnie once, and it stuck with me, but Don is, <laughs> doesn't matter to him. Just like Sue, Susie, or Susan, you know. So, you know, you are, I, I, see, I see three, I see three there, you know. There's three there. He's body, he's spirit, he's mind. And so um, he said, but spirit, spirituality, God's irrelevant, and to, it seems to his generation. Morals, values, et cetera. And also, there's a strong sense, and this is the part that makes the other parts of us, the older generation, really upset because this generation, I'm not going to point at you, but that generation has this sense of entitlement that everything is owed to them. We work for it. Why should we just give it to them, you know, or whatever? They're, they're, they have this entitlement, and that's what makes them very prone to socialism. Because socialism really preaches, we'll take care of you, you know. And so this is where the conflicts in our culture and society are arising from a whole lot. And so this, you know, um, I, I mentioned in my reply, I said the social media part seems to be the main difference. 
one of my generation's great concerns, speaking of, of these, this generation, is the loss of our nation and the lack of patriotism. Yeah, I went up to uh, school first thing in the morning. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I don't know how many people out on the street now below the age of 25 or so could really have done that and said that, that actually they know the pledge. I know every word to the Star Spangled Banner. How many of this younger generation could say that? They don't because they have gone into a globalist situation. And I understand that. I don't agree with it because I believe, you know, and there's a hypocrisy that too because you might not be a globalist, but you are this one, you're for this sports team or you're for that sports team. That's capitalizing on one entity, the New York Yankees or the Philadelphia Phillies. Well, now in this case, it's going to be the Houston Astros or the Philadelphia Phillies if you follow the World Series at all. That's what's coming up. And, uh, but yet, you know, I'm an American. And America used to mean something, patriotism. Now, our brother Dan, you know, he's a veteran, and he really, he really can uh, speak to this. And uh, if you're watching Dan, God bless you. And, of course, Don's a veteran, too. He was in Korea, and I just had a big plop of kimchi on my salad tonight. Man, it was good. Don't get too close. You're going to smell the garlic. But, um, uh, uh, you know, patriotism, nationalism was something that was instilled in us. It didn't matter if you were a Democrat or a Republican or a libertarian or whatever, you were still an American. But today, nah, we're a globalist. And I see it. I mean, here I am talking to a guy about my bank down the street, and I'm talking to him, and he's in the Philippines. There we go. You know, and of course, Amazon, all these corporations have gotten so global in their outreach and in their concept that they don't really care much for what city they put their headquarters in anymore because they embrace the whole world. You can order... Uh, something on Amazon from the Philippines if you want, or you can order something from Amazon from Lebanon Junction if you want. And there's a warehouse right down the street, and you probably have it in two days now. You know, And so that's, um, that's what's going on in this world. So uh, he said, uh, I told him, um, it doesn't matter to younger people. We have no wish to embrace globalism, but the younger generation seems to be very fine with it. Our concept of other, and one last thing here, I was talking to him. He said, our concept of other for me and for our generation, is the person, you know, is, is you. That's my concept of other, is you, the people I'm with, the people I'm sitting with and talking to right now. You are the other in my experience at the moment. But for this generation, this, this new culture coming up that we're having to struggle, that I'm having to struggle to, con to understand, their concept of other might be in the Philippines, <laughs> might be somewhere on the Internet. Uh, when I was with Deaf Teen Quest, it was an organization where we ministered to teenagers uh, that were deaf and, and uh, preached the gospel to them, and we did different places and took them on outings and things like this. And uh, I get so frustrated. We, we tried to forbid them having their um, device with them. You know, uh, uh, there's a scripture coming to my mind that says, beware of his devices, the devil's devices. That's how it's interpreted. You know. Well, and, and because you would have one, two, you might have four or five of these kids I knocked my coffee over. I'm glad the lid was down. We might have four or five of these kids sitting on a bench somewhere or anything in one of these outings, right? and every one of them is busy texting somebody, but they're not talking to each other. And I thought, isn't that amazing? Here they are. They should all be hanging out and all, you know, face-to-face -face and the expression and, and the stories and, and a little laughter and a little But no, they're sitting there, and somebody sitting next to them, you know, you know. And I thought, their concept of other is not here, it's out there, it's over there, it's somewhere else, what I am connected to. I'm not connected to you all right now, um, and maybe I don't want to be. So there's no really willingness to adapt to others, you know, to compromise, to engage, and to relate, because if you look and say, that's not my type, then that's all you need to do. Now, he's not wearing vans, he's wearing buddies or whatever. <laughs> I'm is there still buddies out there? <laughs> I don't know. That was a shoe. Yeah. But yeah, it was just a Kmart, you know, whatever you found on sale. You had, you had vans and you had buddies, you know. Um, but the thing is, that's what's going on in this generation today. So people get frustrated, uh, maybe you, maybe me, of what we're seeing going around us. And if we're not careful, we can let that dominate our, our um, oh, 
our attitude, the way we feel. And we can't do that. We've got to get focused and defocused in the Word more today than we ever were. Walk in the Word of God. And put this word, it says, your word, Lord, you know, I've hidden my heart that I've not sinned against you, but, but your word, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable unto you. And we need to walk in the knowledge of the word of God and let it fulfill itself through us. And that's an amazing thing about God's word. You confess it. You don't have to feel it. You don't have, you have to believe it, but you don't have to necessarily experience it for it to finally come true in your life. You just hold on to it. How many of you are saved? Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I'm saved. Praise God. And the Bible says we're saved. But did you look in the mirror today? You sure don't look saved. You don't look saved. Even Peyton, as young as he is, and Jason, and Jason's fairly young, they're saved, but they don't look saved. But yet, the Bible says, speak of things that are not as though they were. Now, to the world, that's a hypocrisy. That's a lie. You mean you lie? You speak of things that aren't as though they were? You say, uh, uh, I, I can't afford that house. I can afford that house. I'm going to get that house. God's going to bless me, you know, whatever it is. We speak of things that are not as though they were. It will be fulfilled. Jesus spoke before he was crucified. He said, he, said, uh, he spoke of himself in another person, but he, he even mentioned it like uh, talking about Jonah. Like it was with Jonah. Jonah's in the well, and after three days, he come out. He says, so shall the Son of Man be three days in the earth, and then he'll rise. You know, he was speaking of his resurrection before his crucifixion. He was speaking of things that weren't as though they were because he was God in the flesh. But we have the same mind. He said, let the same mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. The same spirit, it says, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, let it dwell in you and it will quicken. That means give life to your mortal bodies. So walk in that spirit. Oh, and it's so much better than walking in the flesh of this world because this world's way is going down and down and down and down. It's getting worse. Wickedness is getting more wicked, but God's people are getting more blessed. We are going to be blessed, and we are blessed. But um, uh, there's a word here in our our scripture, our our text for the night, and I'm not just now getting started. I, I, I know I've spent a little bit of time on this, so I won't uh, um, like say that was an intro. It wasn't, but um, uh, it says, um, um, I was reading something to make sure I didn't skip anything. That I, yes, okay, I didn't. Uh, Psalm number 37. Uh, you know the most quoted book in the Bible by Jesus was the book of Psalms. He quoted, he quoted Psalms, I don't know how many times. In the New Testament, Psalms are quoted uh, by all the writers except just said for two by all people of involved in the writing of the New Testament over a hundred or one hundred quotes come from the Psalms and Jesus quoted the Psalms more than he did and the Psalms keep in mind most most of them uh, the, 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 the most notable were written by King David David who was Jesus was the son of David. He was from the line of David. David was that king that pleased God the most. He was very special. He had a he had a heart after God. You know, he even after he had fallen. Now Jesus never fell. He never sinned. He was perfect. He was God in the flesh. He had to keep the law. He had to live a perfect sinless life so that he would be our propitiation and he would be our savior. He lived the life David, King David, was born of a flesh the same as we were. He had a mother of this world, and he had a father of this world. Jesus had a mother of this world, a virgin after the flesh, uh, but a father, his father, the Holy Spirit, who came upon this, uh, this virgin girl named Mary, and uh, she became pregnant with the Savior of the world. Uh, he was born of God, the only begotten of God. He lived that perfect life, but David, um, he failed. He fell down. He messed up. A woman named Bathsheba uh, got his eye, you know, taking a bath on a rooftop. I would say she should have known better, but maybe that was all right. I don't know. that. You know, uh, I don't stand on the rooftop at my place, but <laughs> if I did, I might see somebody taking a bath in their backyard. I don't know. But, but the, the whole point is he, he fell. He got tempted. He got, you know, and, he, and we know the story. Yet after that, he had the great the psalm. If you read Psalm 51, Psalm 51 is David's repentance before God when he realized and when he really, he knew, but when he finally come to terms with the fact that he had 
fallen. He had failed God. And he said, you know, God have mercy on me, a sinner. He, uh, I mean, that was part of that. Well, that wasn't an exact quote. That was from the tax collector in the temple. But he, he um, said, against thee, thee only, have I committed this sin and done this, this great thing against you. And, uh, and so God forgave him, put his sin away, he said. So there was salvation, of course, in the Old Testament because it was based on the coming Messiah, and Jesus was going to come from his ver very family, uh, from his very uh, bloodline, uh, from the from uh, his tribe. Uh, and uh, uh, later, it was written by, uh, it was spoken by God through the prophet. He said, "David, a man after my own heart." So that shows how totally absolved from sin David was, because God said that David is a man after my own heart. So that helps you to know that when you fall, when you mess up, you repent. And from that point on, you're a man after God's own heart. He remembers your sins against you no more. They are removed. And it's nice to know. It's wonderful to know. It's, it's the gospel to know that we are forgiven, that we can stand. We can go boldly before the throne of grace and make our needs known in our time. You know, in our time of need, we go boldly. We don't have to sorry, shuffle in and say, well, listen, God, I got, the, I got this. No, we can say, Lord, I stand here in Jesus. I stand here in Jesus. And when you see me, you see the Savior. I am in Christ. And, Lord, I ask for this in his name. Ask knowing it is his will. And it says, do not fret. Verse 30, uh, Psalm 37, do not fret because of evildoers. King James says, "King James says, do not fret thyself, you know, because of, but do not fret." I was talking in King James with uh, Lois before church. We, so it's another language. So, do not fret because of evil doers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. The word fret, by the way, the Hebrew word did a little, you know, had a little footnote uh, study on it. it. Says fret means to warm up and warm up until you blow up. You know, sometimes uh, Barney Fife, I liked his expression, nip it, nip it in the bud. You know, when you feel yourself, you're going to fret. You feel that uh, Barney Fife was this guy. He was a deputy to a sheriff in Mayberry. I don't know if you know that. Okay. Barney, but Barney Fife used to always say, nip it, nip it in the bud. You know, don't let it become a problem. We should fret not ourselves because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. Uh, a lot of times people want to be in envious. Be content with what you have, and God will bless you with what you need. And uh, he said, For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. herb. Uh, there's a lot of, um, you know, this world's system and this world's economy and this world's empires. It says the, ki the kingdoms of our Lord, or the kingdoms of this world, rather, are going to become the kingdoms of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All these things are going to fall. And uh, sometimes I wonder why they're not falling already. The, the, the deficit, uh, years ago, I can remember when we talked about billions of dollars of a deficit in our economy, that America was so many billion dollars in debt. And you thought, man, we need to get out of that kind of debt because, you know, just personally, you know what that means. Well, they're paying all this interest on this debt because it's international debt. And, you know, economies, government, you, economies can collapse if they don't maintain their debt payments and all this and we were billions hundreds of billions of dollars in debt and that was like whew, man well do you know now it's probably over 30 trillion 30 trillion and uh, who you, you could never in a lifetime count to a trillion even if you did it by tens and uh, someone told me once if somebody gave you a dollar I mean gave you a million dollars not a dollar a million dollars every day since Jesus was born since go back to the nativity and you were there at the birth of Christ and you were an immortal being, let's be marvel about it now or, or whatever. Somebody gave you a million dollars every day since then, you still would not have arrived at one trillion dollars. That's how much a trillion. And I run the numbers and that's true. We, we'd be less than uh, 900 billion dollars now, which another hundred billion and it will be a trillion, you know. So, you know, and our country being in debt, all that, you know. Um, so this world system, it, it is building for a fall. It's, it's, uh, it's like a house of cards, you know, and uh, there will be a great economic fall. We read in the book of Revelations, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, one of them uh, holds a scale, and it's financial ruin. Another is uh, a disease, and another is war. And uh, the, the, the pale horse, you know, uh, read those um, in the first chapter or first or second chapter of Revelations it's, uh, and, and understand the metaphor that's being made there is predicting what's coming upon this earth. And... Um, uh, I trust we'll be seeing it from the balcony, not from the front row. 
uh, because our Savior is coming, praise God. And uh, but it says, uh, they shall soon be cut down with the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Here's our way. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Trust him. Don't be critical. Don't be uh, judgmental. Don't always be like they were in the wilderness. Uh, as soon as they, you know, they saw all the great miracles and the provision of God, what wonderful things he's done for them. And as soon as they got out there, they didn't have any water. Instead of just saying, you know, praying says, Lord, we're thirsty. We need some water. They began to gripe. Gripe against Moses says, what's with this? You bring us out of Egypt to kill us here? So were there enough graves back in Egypt? You know, somebody said it was the first Jewish joke. So weren't there enough graves in Egypt that we had to come out here to die? And um, uh, because they didn't have any water, but God instructed Moses to strike that rock, water come out of it. He provided for them. Or no, they went to a place called Mara first, you know, and sometimes God's answer or your answer is not God's answer. You, you can have a good idea, but it's not a God idea. Well, they come to a place called Mara, and it was a bitter spring. It was poisonous. They, they smelled the water, you know. Uh, I don't know what it smelled like. I've smelled sulfur water before, but you can drink it. But, uh, but they said, now this is poisonous. And he instructed Moses, he says, take a branch from that tree and throw it in the water, and it'll become sweet. And uh, we just studied that in the... Uh, um, Exodus and you know that's a symbol of the cross take the wood the cross of Jesus Christ throw it into your bitter life and he'll make it sweet so you know it's a, it's, it's a good analogy to that they did it they could drink that water but they had griped they had complained and it got them to that point and they, they needed the cross to get through there they needed that that uh, action which uh, once again uh, Jesus is uh, concealed in the Old Testament revealed in the New and what happened later it was just another day or two later they go into a place had um, had uh, seven, no, it had uh, 12 springs of water, and each one of them, I think, had seven palm trees, you know. And, I mean, it was a beautiful, God's got something good waiting for you. Don't complain. And if there's one lesson that, that God's word is teaching me, it's just like it starts out here, do not fret. Do not fret. Something bad is going to happen. You might have a flat tire on the way home, and I pray you don't. Something bad is going to happen in your life. You're going to have a challenge. You're going to have a problem. But don't let your knee-jerk reaction to be complaining. Say, God, what did I do now? How come you're chasing me down? How come this? You know, that's not who we serve. We don't fret. We say, praise the Lord. Praise God. God, you're going to get me through this, aren't you? What's going to happen? Be, be upbeat. Give him that smile that Jeff always has, you know. Give him that smile. Give it that smile. Smile at your problem because God's on your side. You're not in this alone. Lord, help us if we were. You know, Jesus is with us. So don't fret. It says, trust and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord. One of my favorite scriptures that we quote uh, from time to time. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord. Make Jesus and make the word of God, make your Christian life the source of your delight. Be delighted in those things. Don't say, well, I've done church, now I'm going to go and I'm going to do this. This is going to be my, my, no, Jesus is over that too. You might be a skateboarder. You might be a, a pool player. I, I wouldn't say you hang out at the, the pool hall, you know, but you, whatever you do, you might be a coon hunter, you know. Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Do all to the glory of God. That's what it amounts to. Now, if you take Jesus into everything you do and you don't compartmentalize your life, say, well, I got business. Business is business, and boy, we're ruthless. We're going to grab our part of the market. We're going to choke the money out of those people, whatever we got to do. Oh, now I'm in church. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you. Now I'm going home, and I'm going to kick the dog and yell at the wife. You know, uh, whatever. You know, no, we don't compartmentalize our Jesus is Lord. That means he's over all. So in business, we're going to be fair, and we're going to be right, and we're going to do the right thing. Even if it says a man will swear to his own hurt and change not if he's a righteous man. You're not going to change it. You're going to keep your word. You're going to keep your word and be a man of God's word. And then whatever you're doing, whatever, going out there hunting them coon dogs. If you miss that shot, don't cuss. Don't kick the dog. You know, if he trees a, trees a possum instead of a coon. I don't know. Do they ever do that? Will they? Okay. You, get the, you stupid dog. That ain't a coon. That's a possum. You know, whatever. No. No, you say, well, praise God, you've got to learn something here, don't you, dog? That's not a coon. But what it is is live for the Lord in all of your life, and he'll bless you for it. 
you'll have peace. Don't get mad. Fret not because of evildoers or evil situations. He said, um, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He'll give you the desires of your heart. He says, commit your way to the Lord. That means surrender to him. It means surrender to him. Trust also in him. Trust in him. Uh, and he shall bring it to pass. Don't let Jesus be the first person you go to, the last person, I mean, you go to in a time of trouble. Seems like we say, well, I tried everything. I guess I'm going to have to pray. No, you should have prayed first, and you wouldn't have had to try everything else. You know, bring it to the Lord first. Bring it to the Lord first. It says, commit your way unto the Lord, in verse 5. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. It said he shall. It's not instantaneous. You know, sometimes the blessing and the answer to prayer doesn't come because you got up off your knees. you got to wait on the Lord. Things are going to have to fall together. You're going to have to fight the good fight of faith. It means God said it. I believe it. It's his word. It's his promise. And I'm not going to give it up. I'm just going to hang on to it. I know. I see that. Yeah, I know. I see that. But I heard that. I see that. And I'm going to hang on to what God said. And uh, commit your way. And uh, he said, your justice, he said, he shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Um, we need to make sure uh, that we rest in the Lord. We just don't be constantly busy, constantly working and working and working and fretting about this and doing that and being involved in that. Uh, sometimes people work enough to keep them out of trouble. But, well, you know, our downtime should be a time of rest and of peace and a time with our family, you know, in our home. And uh, with our loved ones, um, you know, uh, uh, talk to your wife, guys. They might teach you something, you know. <laughs> Listen and, and, and have, you know, have, have that time of rest. Uh, uh, I had a very busy, very kind of frustrating week and had to just, you know, the Lord saw me through things uh, and brought me through things. A, a dear friend passed away, 93 years old, this coming December and ready to go home and be with Jesus. He was a member of our deaf church for, for many years. I've known him probably for 40 years. But... Uh, I was, you know, for the visitation Friday night, I was there, and then uh, I preached the funeral um, Saturday and with the family, and I was kind of got strung out. Just I was just kind of, it was, it was a little emotional for me, too. He was a, he was a friend, and it, and it just affected me and just brought back such a rush of wonderful memories, and I'm going to miss him and thinking about him. So, you know, um, Sunday I stayed home, just had a day of rest. I know, you know, coming to church is a wonderful time, and, 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 and I very seldom miss coming to the church, but the Lord just sort of spoke to us both that morning and says, you know, we're just going to stay in today and just be in the peace of the Lord. Um, that's a rare thing that should happen. And like I say, we, uh, we administered all day uh, 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 Saturday, uh, preaching the funeral and ministering to people and talking to them. So it was a time of rest. And um, so we need to rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Wait on the Lord. Uh, wait is an art. Waiting is an art. Because if we're not careful, we're going to say, well, Lord, when are you going to do it? Huh? Yet? Not? Not yet? When? 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 That's not waiting on the Lord. You know, just be patient. And enjoy the Lord, enjoy his word, read and just say he's going to take care. Uh, verse uh, 7, uh, the second half, as it goes in there, it says, Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way. Uh, we look back and say, why are these things happening around us? Uh, why are the rich getting richer? Why are these uh, leaders uh, in, in this world that are so evil and wicked, when you hear what they're saying and see what they're doing, why are they succeeding and prospering, Lord? Why is this happening? God knows it. You know, nobody hates evil more than the Lord does. He says it all through his word. God is going, he's patient, though. He said he's not willing that any should perish, that all should come to everlasting life. God is not wanting to finally shut the door to the ark and let them all drown, but that day will come. Uh, finally, the day come, got Lot and his family out of Sodom and Gomorrah whoo, and killed and toasted a bunch of people. It was the end. God knew that there, he knew the hearts of each one, that they were unrepentant, they wouldn't turn to him. But until there's a chance that a few and only God knows who will come, then it's going to be postponed until we get to the time that just the wicked remain and this world will be destroyed. Uh, read in Revelations and read what those people were like. Uh, it was, they were so evil that when he's coming, instead of repenting, they were so hard-hearted and so bitter, he said they went into the caves and and yelled for the stones to fall in on him to hide him from the face of him who was coming. Rather than, he said, instead of repenting, instead of repenting. Repenting requires humility. Repenting means something that's, that, that, that's actually says, I'm sorry, I was wrong. And um, you hear that, men, <laughs> sometimes. 
it's tougher for men, I think, in that because we, I don't know, we put in a position in our generation. I don't know about this new generation. They don't even know if they're men or not. But um, I'm, I'm sorry. I apologize for that. But, uh, you know, it seems, uh, seems like there's weird stuff coming on that you wonder, how in the world can anybody have problems in that area? But, um, but we need, you know, need to be humble before God. It says if you, uh, if you, God gives grace to the humble, it said in James. If we're just humble before the Lord and say, God, without you, I can do nothing. One of the greatest acts of humility I saw was King Hezekiah. When he was surrounded by the Assyrian army, he was overwhelmed, and he was going to be destroyed, him and all Jerusalem. They, he saw no way. There was 180,000 Assyrians out there. Uh, I think it was, might have been more than that, 180,000. I remember that number for some reason of Assyrian soldiers that are going to destroy him. They have come in. They spoke in Hebrew when he asked them not to because he didn't want the people to be discouraged up on the walls. And they said, your God can't do nothing. Your God is a pansy. You don't have a God. What happened to the gods of these other countries that we've overrun and destroyed? Hezekiah took the guy's letters and all that he said. He went into the temple, and he laid it all out on the floor there. And he said, Lord, he says, this is what he says about us. This is what he says about you. There's no way we can whip them. He says, Lord, our eyes are on you. Sometime you might be at that point in your own life and you say, God, I've done all I can do. I know what I'm up against. Lord, my eyes are on you. The next morning, there were over 180,000 dead Assyrians outside the wall. They didn't even have to fight. The angel of the Lord went through the camp and whacked them all. I mean... God is on your side. Now, he'll make, for a Christian, we can say he'll make even your enemies be at peace with you if your ways please him. So if a man's ways please the Lord, he'll cause even his enemies to be at peace with him. So keep yourself focused not on beating your enemy and outwitting him and, and, and trumping him with, uh, with a different word or, or, or a better idea or something like that. No, keep your eyes on the Lord and say, Lord, I submit it to you. You speak to me and be humble before God. And he'll make even people who plan bad things against you to be at peace with you. It's amazing how God does those things. He likes to do those things because it teaches us what he's like, and it's so much different than what we, than what we lean towards. Um, we're about finished with this. Well, no, we're not, but I'll uh, not, not do all of it tonight. I'll keep an eye on the time here. But uh, it, says, um, it says, don't worry about the man who brings um, wicked things to pass. In verse 8, it says, I think it's verse 8. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. There's never going to be a time, according to the word of God, if you get all fretful and all out of joint, that it's not going to cause harm. A plus B equals C, right? Don't fret. It only causes harm. You're not going to see any good come out of it. And ultimately, and you'll look back, and say, man, I wish I wasn't upset about that. I wish I wasn't fretting about that because uh, God had it the whole time. I'm embarrassed. Whatever, those things happen. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. They that wait upon the Lord. Patience is a tough thing. I want patience, but I want it right now. And, you know, that's, that's the paradox of patience, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yet for a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, and it will be no more. In the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, there is going to be the joy and the peace and the presence of the Lord. And the, oh, the, the, I've heard people, and you take with a grain of salt these uh, near-death life experiences and people who have died and gone to heaven and come back. And I've read of some that are really convincing to me, but uh, I, I always listen to them in view of what God's word says. I don't let that be the thing that persuades me what their experience might have been. You know, it could have been just something messed up in their head that made them say things. I don't know, but uh, most all the, so many of them I've uh, seen and heard talked about how overwhelmingly they felt loved by God, how overwhelmingly they felt total freedom, and the expression, at home. I never felt so much at home, like I'm finally arrived where I've always wanted to be, where inside me there's always been this craving, this yearning to be there, to be in this state that I'm not in, to be in this frame of mind, this way of, of living that I'm not in. It's in every man. Uh, it says in Ecclesiastes, he said, God has put into the heart of every man eternity. He has put a craving for eternity in our hearts and lives. That's why we have funerals. That's why we miss people. That's why we question what's after. Um, you know, uh, 
or the first say one time you go out into the woods deer hunting and you won't find a you know a group of deer standing in a circle dropping flowers on a place where some buck was killed last season you know you know having a little memorial service there or something like that no it's in the hearts of man the knowledge of eternity and the desire from it C.S. Lewis when he would be aware of it he said uh, I was surprised by joy suddenly it was like just like the Holy Spirit kicked over a bucket of honey in my heart just unexpected whatever I was doing where I was all of a sudden I was surprised by joy have you ever had one of those experiences that just where you just suddenly felt wow God is so good I feel heaven is going to be so wonderful and then you know and then it, it fades you just can't hang on to it but the Lord just opens that window into our lives now and then and I'm so glad he does when we're looking for him you got to look for it you can go right past something you're not looking for and it could be something wonderful and uh, it said evildoers will be cut off it said yet for a little while the wicked will be no and I see and you'll look for his place but it shall be no more it's talking about what this world will be but the meek says in uh, verse 11 but the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace I don't know how many of us are going to be in the kingdom of God I don't know what the numbers are the city the great city to come down but this world is going to be for a thousand years inhabited by people there's going to be children born uh, the tempter is going to be loosed after a thousand years and uh, try to start another war and everything then it'll finally be over we're going to have an over and then we're going to have an over over it's kind of funny to think of but uh, it says in you know revelation that teaches in the word of god that at the end when jesus ascends and and the kingdom begins and the devil is said he's chained up and thrown into a pit for a thousand years at which time he will be released and he will test the nation. So during that thousand years, there are people who who survive the um, the apocalypse and who who uh, you know uh, uh, many uh, are Christian people. But I guess there's an opportunity for people to still reject Jesus. Uh, you can read that out. It's God's word, not mine. You know, and and then there's going to be a war. But he said he'll end that quickly with a word from his mouth. It'll be done, and they'll all be thrown into the lake of fire for eternity the devil the antichrist the whole gang that was chained up down there and uh then it will be over over it'll be finally you know really over but um then there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth uh this earth will be gone there won't be any oceans anymore we you know we read of that that's going to be um, and that's all clearly stated in god's word so the best is yet to come and uh whether we we are changed in that moment when he repeat when he uh, returns or we're raised from the dead and you know, and, and our bodies are reunited with our spirit when he says uh, he's coming back and that we don't mourn. At funerals, a, a funeral scripture says we mourn not like those that have no hope, but knowing that Christ is coming again, he's going to bring the departed with him, and the dead in Christ are going to rise, and we'll join with them. So your loved ones who died in Christ are coming back with him, and um, but the wicked will not survive in this uh, present uh, situation, and, and wickedness that we see is not going to uh, uh, continue beyond a certain point that God's going to permit. Until then, he's on your side. He's with you. God is for me. And uh, Romans says, if God be for me, now think about just how heavy that is. If God, who is God, the creator of all that is, was, ever shall be, God, the creator of Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and all those planets out there, trillions and trillions of light years away, it means how long it takes to travel going the speed of light, a trillion years, and there's a star that you can see that that's far away. To know that, that he is out, that the God that created all things and created you and loves you has got a home for you and he loves you. And if he is for you, and he says he's for you because you accepted his son, his sacrifice for you, then who can be against you? Who could possibly win against you? Nothing. Uh, don't, uh, Paul said, don't, uh, Jesus says, don't fear him who can kill the body. He can't touch the spirit and the soul. You know, so if, uh, if we end up in a situation you were to be martyred, for the for the for the gospel and many people are and churches have been assaulted by um, uh, terrorists in uh, North Africa and places where people in the middle of a service praising and worshiping God and they've been killed and said well God wasn't watching out after them wasn't well I can't say that because um, they're in a better place they're in the presence of the Lord we just uh, we got to trust God and wherever we are and whatever we're doing because he's a good God he's a merciful God got some prayer needs tonight we want to um, to uh, uh, remember uh, want to pay pray for our pastor um, they've got a bug he said and uh, um, I heard Abigail was doing better and that uh, I don't know the conditions everybody when he texted me uh, we talked about it a little um, but we want to pray also for um, uh, Rob our brother Rob Long he lost his father not too long ago and he uh, he was in church Sunday I understand 
and so uh, uh, we want to uh, uh, remember uh, his family and uh, also um, um, let's see who did I put here okay here we go Kathy Marsh yeah, I was reading the list I had there's a, a brief list here pray for uh, for the pastor and his family for Kathy Marsh uh, pray that uh, for about con concerning the strokes that she's had and uh, uh, she's in Fraser uh, rehab I believe now and um, and uh, Rob Long's family and the uh, Benzel uh, Benzel family that's my friend who's uh, whose uh, funeral we, we did this uh, weekend uh, pay pray for that family for their comfort um, that they'll just get through this time in mourning uh, we mourn but we don't mourn like those without hope and um, so we have a time of separation and a time that we, we deal with and any other needs any other needs uh, tonight anybody got uh, something they need to pray for then or maybe personal maybe it's um, something uh, uh, you're dealing with inwardly and you just uh, can't articulate it or what have you but God knows and uh, we'll pray for that situation and uh, I've got a situation like that right now uh, sometimes uh, things uh, with your kids and with families and situations you just don't want to speak about out loud because you really don't even know how to sometimes you just know that there's something there and so um, uh, I want to pray for that any other needs then okay well let's go to the Lord in prayer Father God, we thank you, Lord, that you are a good God. You are a merciful God. And, Lord, nothing is impossible with you. And, Lord, we know that, uh, that we should be anxious for nothing and fret about nothing. We'll be anxious for nothing, but with all prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving, we make our requests known to you, Lord, and that your peace, you promise that we, after we do that, that the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So, Lord, we look for your peace after we give you our prayers. And, Lord, we receive it. We thank you for it. We pray, Father, for our pastor and his family for complete recovery from this uh, bug that they have, this uh, virus. Lord, that they be well and whole from this. In Jesus' name, Lord, that each one of them by tomorrow morning will, will feel on top of, their, top of themselves, Lord, that they'll be good and ready to go. Lord, bless them, touch them, heal them in Jesus' name. And, Lord, we pray, uh, Father, for Rob Long and his family for, uh, for their comfort during this uh, time, Lord, uh, uh, this time of mourning and the passing of his father, Lord. And we pray, Lord, for your peace in their heart and in their homes and in their lives. And, Lord, that they have a, have a hopefulness, Lord, in knowing that, that, it's, uh, that it's not a finality. It's just a postponement. They'll see him again. It's just a separation, as we should say. Lord, that uh, those who have died in Christ that are in the Lord that there's a separation that will be with them again. And, Father, they're better off now than they ever have been. And we just thank you, Lord. We praise you. And, Lord, we pray, Father, for uh, uh, Kathy Marsh, Lord. Raise her up, Father. We pray she be raised up, totally restored, Father, that uh, all the damage, any damage done by this stroke in her, in, uh, in her mind be totally, or in her brain functions, Lord, in her bodily functions, Lord, or in her arms, her feet, her hands, or uh, her, her swallowing, Lord, that all these be totally and completely restored by the hand of God, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, you touch her even now as we're praying, Father, that she be well, Lord, that she be up, she be about, that she be sitting right back there in that chair next to Dan in no, no time at all, Lord. Bless her. Help her, Father, in Jesus' name. Be with her and, and encourage our brother Dan. Help him, Father, as, as, uh, as he's having to travel a lot, going back and forth to the hospital. And, Lord, uh, just uh, the normal stress that would be on one who is a, is a caregiver for, for, the, for their mate, for their husband or wife, Father. That you bless him, encourage him, and help him, Father, in Jesus' name. Bless him. And, Lord, we uh, pray for the Benzel family. I pray, Father, for Kenneth, uh, for Kenneth's daughters, Father, for for Marion and Martha and Kathleen and and um, sin, uh, uh, Linda, Lord, that you bless each and every one of them in that family, Lord, that, that the peace of God be with them and and Lord, uh, that they are so thankful for the for the heritage that they have in their father, for the legacy that he has left them, Lord, and for the blessing, Lord. Uh, that uh, Kenneth was to so many in the deaf community, Lord. He was a man of God. He lived for you, and we, we pray your blessing upon his family, all of his children and his children's children and his children's children's children that he had actually there at the funeral, Lord. We thank you, Father. We pray your blessing in their lives. And, Lord, your peace. We pray for this church, for the ministry of the Holy Spirit, for the power of God to, to rule and reign in our lives, Father, and for people to be saved, healed, and delivered, Father, uh, both here in person and, Father, even on the internet, Lord, did that just be a gateway to where they would actually come into a face-to-face -face relationship with your body and with you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we praise you. We thank you as we leave this night. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.